Mitchell is a comic book artist and a storyteller, and he's also First Nations. As he shares his story, listen for how he pays attention to the fine differentiation between his culture and white culture, or mainstream culture, and how it has impacted his life. Powerful story, wonderful sharing, hope you enjoy. So welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Thanks for taking time. We're just before Christmas, so you've been out running like the rest of us. <laughs> I crazy. Chicken with my head cut off. <laughs> Loving it. <laughs> it's all good. All good. The, um, much of your background has to do with storytelling. Yes. And um, to fill in our audience right away, like who is Brandon Mitchell? Um, you're a graphic novelist, a graphic artist, comic book writer, illustrator. Teach us. Jack, jack of all trades, master of a few. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, uh, I'm, I went to, uh, I, I, I'm from Listigooch. Uh, I'm Big Ma. Uh, I graduated high school in 1998. And right from there, um, I went to uh, study animation in uh, Miramichi. Oh, okay. Community college over there. Yeah, it was really? a great, excellent program. So, so whereabouts is your home community located in relation to Miramichi? How far away are you? Less than two hours. Okay. So the great thing about that was, uh, I, uh, the great thing about it was we weren't far from home. Yeah. So if I wanted to go home for the, if I missed home, yeah. it was only a two-hour drive. Yeah. That was the great thing about it. Uh, I don't know if my parents enjoyed it as much as I did, but uh, <laughs> never had dirty laundry. <laughs> yeah. 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 This is cool. Um, but yeah, no, I, I was there for uh, uh, two and a half years. Uh, the great thing about the, the college or even the, the teachers there uh, was uh, drawing is one part talent, but mostly skill. And like any skill, if you practice, you get better at it. So I was like... Uh, uh, Thanks for sharing that because I really thought it was just uh, talent based. Uh, so uh, they they basically rebuilt me, saying like you've got some talent, but but you don't have the skills. <laughs> let's let's build those skills up. Yeah. And at the end, I had a really great portfolio. And um, actually, before I uh, graduated, I graduated in December of two thousand. And uh, before graduation, I was offered the teaching position back home. So I went to go, I was offered to teach to grade one to grade eight, teach them um, art and computers um, at the Alexei Gipu School. And I was just like, yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. It was a great opportunity for me to give back mm -hmm. and to share what, uh, to share what I, I learned. So I had a lot of fun doing that. So what was the Miramichi school experience like? Was first time away from home, I assume. I'm not too far away to go back and get the laundry done, grab some food, and then scoop back. But did you have a mentor that saw you through some of the key transitions, or a special teacher? Or was there a cast of characters that you bonded oh, with? Oh, jeez. Miramichi is a unique place. It's it's got its own Miramichi is vibe. A, Miramichi is a unique place, but it was also it was one of those weird times to be there too. Okay. Because we were there during the, uh, so it was 98, 99. Yeah, this, the, the 99 was a weird year because uh, I built a really good camaraderie with uh, a lot of the students there and the teachers. Um, but one thing that stood out was because it was during uh, the Marshall decision just came out and there was already standoff uh, the previous year over lobster. Um, and I didn't know how passionate people were about non-indigenous people were about lobster fishing and that was one of my first forays into like okay you're here you stay on your side and i'll stay on my side so it was it was really back then uh, i saw the divide and i was like oh okay it was one of those uh and it was even in the classroom too like like the friends i thought i were friends where when this came up, they're just like, and a lot of it was they didn't really know their history or our history, so it wasn't like I held it, uh, yeah, held on to it, and I was just like, you guys just don't know, and <laughs> I'm not, I'm not here to teach, I'm here to learn, yeah. So, um, but and, and but it was just a sign of those times too, right? And I was just like, I'm just, I'm here to focus on this stuff, yeah, and this triggers you and it triggers me 
we're not going to we're not going to see through this. I'm just not going to bring it up. Yeah. And we just moved on from it. But uh, but that was it was really it was a great experience. But it was a like part parts of it were weird too. Yeah, it's, that's a tough lesson when politics in a bigger sphere come to find themselves in a microcosm like a community college and your first experience with. Yeah, and so, the and the other part too is that in my in my class there was like I think there was there was about thirty of us and I was the only uh, native student there. So it was really one of those things where it's like uh, the thing I was wrestling with too is like, am I an artist or am I a native artist? Right. And that was one of the things that, uh, I, I had to really th- not think about, but I wrestled with because the perception of what, um, because I grew up on, uh, watching Peter Pan movies or what I saw in pop culture and how we were portrayed. I was like, that's not. That's not me. Uh, <laughs> that's Hollywood. That's or Hollywood. That's, that's and then, and then, and then the other part too is it's like uh, uh, you see those uh, commemorative plates, and I'm like, that's not us. Like yeah. the, the romanticized version, and um, but it was a means in the way I look at it. It was a means for artists to pay the bills. Yep. Like yep. You're, at least you're creating, and at least you're doing something. But yep. I knew when I was going into the school, even though I wasn't saying it out loud, I knew what I wanted to avoid doing. And when I went to the, when I went back home to teach, I was showing the kids the skills that I learned and demystifying. And that was, for me, it's about, it's about uh, demystifying. Like, this is not some type of secret club that you guys can't get access to. You guys can. You guys will. I'm going to show you. If this is what you want to do, this is what you got to do to get in. Yep. And you don't have to compromise yep. who you are. What you said is so straightforward and so powerful because it's easily pictured, you know, a 19 or 18 year old in Miramichi. And and this other issue comes floating in from the side, which begs basic questions for you. Am I an artist or a First Nations artist or a native artist? Have you settled that one? Has it blended together yet or will that just be the way it is and you can dance both worlds? I don't. I want to say yes and I think yes. I'm believing more that I'm an artist and it just so happens that I'm um, a, a native artist. But the thing is, is uh, a lot of the, the, the work or say I want to try and get, uh, it's almost pigeonholed yeah. or in a niche market now. I'm kind of like, but I can do these really great, I have these really great ideas. And they're like, uh, no, you only do native stuff. I'm like, but I, no, no, <laughs> all right then. But my soul says I want yeah, to do this. But way. I want to do this for a little bit. But I reconcile that because then I see like uh, there's a lot of things now about appropriation, and I didn't <clears throat> back then. I didn't. I took for granted our stories. I took it for granted my upbringing, and I was like, oh, this is like a common experience or whatever, and no one's going to want to hear about that or know about that. And as I went along, one of the stories I wrote uh, it was actually easier to write about because I was writing on an experience I had, and it was easier to tell a narrative that I was trying to tell because yep. when I was, when I was putting the, my little Easter eggs in there, I was like, Oh yeah, this is easy to write about because I went through this and, and just the story naturally flowed. And I was like, oh, okay. And when I tell them, when I tell people about that, Oh yeah, this was based off of uh, a canoe trip I was on. They're like, Oh, Oh, okay, cool. Like interesting. Eh? Do you want to uh, share with us? You, Cause you, Oh uh, yeah. So yeah, I brought some, some books. With, so the, the one uh, I was talking about was uh river run. Okay. So that's the one I... Uh, I'll hold it up. Uh, that's a book I wrote, and it was based on traditional tobacco use and smoking cessation, or whatever, yep. anti-smoking. And um, I was given the parameters. This is what it has to touch upon. As long as you hit these marks, you can write about whatever you want to write about. Um, and then I was like... Uh, I gave a couple of pitches and right away I was like, I tossed, before I submitted my pitch, I tossed it because I was like, nope, there's another story I want to try and write about. And this was, a, it, and I was like, well, why don't I do something about one of my experiences? Uh, not that I was an avid smoker, but what if I write about the canoe trip I was on and how those three days I grew in those three days. Yeah. And so I spliced that into a larger the story with the parameters I was given so yeah I was able to sneak in and it was a lot easier to write something that I had experience with yeah. than just trying to grab stuff from the air and 
Yeah, it's one of those exercises about write about what you know. Yeah. Th- those sorts of, but at the same time, people, uh, other authors have been on and say, well, but who am I to talk about that? You know, you, that question is significance or yeah. is my story relevant to other people? Um, tied to this. So this one, River Run, is based on personal experience. How how did you come to even build it or create it? Was there someone that said, Brandon, can you start doing a series of comic books for us on on your adventures? So you know, okay, yeah, so I kind of jumped. Uh, I, I it's okay. And how jumped, old? I jumped about five five years to get to that point. Okay, maybe even longer. Um, so going back to uh, teaching at the school, uh, I I was uh, I don't know if I had any right to be there. Because I was like, I don't know how to teach guys. I, um, and they're just like, I already had a reputation of being good with kids and I knew how to draw. And, and they're just like, you're, you're going to, you're going to do well in this. You're going to do well in this. I'm like, okay. If you guys think so. Yeah. And, uh, but sure enough though, I, like I, I walked in there without any, um, it was like, for me, it's just, it, it's about giving respect and receiving respect. And that's how I was able to, uh, for lack of a better word, survive the the classroom. Because even then, too, like I had a wide range of uh, spectrum of kids I was uh, teaching, and I had to be quick on my feet and adapt to learning styles. Things that I took, like I was just like, okay, this kid's acting this way, this kid's acting this way. This is my lesson. How do I accommodate just to kind of get the the point across what I want to what I want to try and do, and uh, these, these like all these things were just kind of natural i just i didn't really get to the point where i wasn't even thinking about it. i was just doing it and at the end i had these kids like drawing uh their own characters their own little comic strips um but even in those first exercises i wasn't showing them any uh native stories or i wasn't showing them any of our stories it was just like here are the skills and as i got more comfortable and figuring figuring out what i was doing i was like uh we're not like how come i'm, I'm not showing our stories or promoting our stories because there was one during one class I mentioned uh Goose Cap and just this like look in her face like who's that and I was like oh no okay all right all right all right so we're gonna do this quick little exercise yeah. I'm gonna do my homework yeah. for you guys and we're gonna do something fun in the next class uh so I uh, was brushing up on the stories I heard uh I remember hearing growing up and I knew that we had some books on some of the legends. I read them, digested them, uh, and then brought them back to the class. And, and when I was reading them, though, I was just like, "There's got to like, there's got to be a way to put my not so much my spin, but my bend or what I've learned in context, yeah, and share it with them." So I uh, uh, one of the exercises I remember in college was taking. Um, a, a story concept like if you have point a point b you're given those two points you have to make up point c like make make your own conclusion so i did that i told them a story and i said okay i stopped and i said well how do you guys want to end it and they got their mind spinning and they're just like uh this is what i'm going to do this is what i'm going to do and so it was really great to see like get that creativity sparked yeah. um but they flipped it on me afterwards because they're like well what would you do <laughs> And I, and I was stuck. I was like, "Oh, geez, I don't, I don't know what I would do. Let me sit on it. I'll get back to you guys." Yeah. And uh, so uh, I went back home, and I was and it really it didn't. It didn't uh, I, I liked the fact that I was challenged. I was like, "What would I do? What would I do?" And uh, and that's where uh, Sacred Circles came along. Uh, it's a, it was with their. Uh, it was really with their uh, just kind of probing me and asking me questions and challenging me um, off of something, uh, an exercise I was giving them and acknowledging that and respecting that too. Cause I wasn't just, I was like, uh, uh, I, uh, I went back to class and I was like, okay guys, here's the, here's what I would do. And here's my concept. And here's what I'm like, I, I just took that exercise and I blew it up and the kids were all excited and like, you should make a comic book. <laughs> and I was like, Maybe I should. Okay, <laughs> sit on. Okay, hold on, guys. Hold on. I'll I'll, I'll be back with this. Um, and uh, so I I was like, uh, and this was back in two thousand one, two thousand two. Nobody was doing native comic books, and if they were, 
uh, like if uh, the the small indie books weren't really getting a lot of attention, uh, and the and what, going back to what I grew up with, right? Like the only native superheroes were the ones in uh, in Marvel or DC. They were either background characters, sidekicks. Uh, they usually didn't last until the first, like past the first issue. Um, uh, not well, a little bit patronizing, but they're just like a, I didn't stereotype uh, stereotypical, and I was just kind of like I looked at them, and I was like, well, it's all I got. I don't have Wolverine, but I'll take Warpath, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> um, and I and I remember not attaching myself to them, but at the same time, I was like, oh, he died. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can you do a thumbnail on Sacred Circles storyline? Uh so story yeah, so like I said, I was challenged with the, by the by my students. They 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 proposed that I like what would you do? And I remember when I was going through the uh, the legends that I was reading them. I was reading about the story about the Genu. And the Genu in our culture is a uh, a cannibal and a cannibal giant. I was like, "Wow, this is a great just the concept alone." I was like, "This writes itself." And, um, uh, but then I was reading the meaning behind the story. I was, uh, the light after the legend, I was reading the story about it. And the Jenna was someone who has lost their way. And I was like, I can, I can really work with this. Then it's, it's a character that lost his way. He used to be part of a community and they're, they're lost. Uh, so that's where the concept of the, the sacred circles came. I was like, I'm going to write about somebody who is lost and who is tortured by that loss. And so the story takes place like the the epilogue starts back in the 1700s, uh, and I was doing a lot of parallels of just trying to uh, subconsciously. I was just like, uh, okay, this is how I'm going to write it, and I'm going to write about uh, 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 trying to rebuild a relationship. But some people don't want to see that built; they just want it the way it used to be. And for me, I was like, well, we're all here. Like we, we we're all here. Like, we got to build this relationship and we need to make it work is the story that I was trying to tell but there's this one character who was like no I want I want it all gone and so in his quest he was cursed and he was banished and then we fast forward to present day and they um, these group of kids unknowingly unlock this creature that was imprisoned and since he was in prison for so long his anger and his hatred just grew. And then when he was free, he wanted to finish what he started. And so the story is about them trying to stop that. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I have the, the ending on my hard drive. <laughs> uh. Yeah, that's a nice dot dot dot. Yeah, to be continued. <laughs> yeah, to be continued. You know? yeah. But but the, but the other hanger. part, yeah, the cliffhanger. But I mean, like, uh, I took a lot of chances because I was just like, um, trying to find funding for this. No one was doing. There was no precedent for what was going on at the time, hmm. and I was like, I've got nothing to lose. I'm gonna just see how far I can take this. And it was one of those things. Like every step of the way, I was like, okay, well, no one said no yet. So I gotta keep <laughs> keep yes. on going, keep on going. Yep. And. Uh, and yeah, it was it was just a lot of uh, it was a lot of fun and it was a really great learning experience. Um, I took it as far as I could, uh, and uh, it was just like it was a combination of things, like just the the uh, starting a business, raising a family, trying to like it was just one of those things like something had to give, and I was like, no, I got to focus on my I got to focus on the family, and yep. I said I'm going to just put this aside for a little bit because I can't. Do it all right now. Yep. And I'm going to come back to when time's right. Um, but in between that time, uh, that's where I got, I uh, was put, um, I got, uh, word spread fast of what I was doing. Yes. And the the funny part was, I remember, uh, and I was writing the script for the third issue. I got a phone call and it was uh, Adam Beach who called me. The, and uh, I was like, uh, he's like, hey, uh, it's Adam. I'm like, yeah, Adam who? Like, Adam Beach. Get the hell out of here. No way. Okay, like, te teach me who is Oh, Adam, Adam Beach, uh, he's Sorry. an actor. Okay. Yeah, he was on, uh, oh, he was briefly on Suicide Squad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he was on uh, uh, Wind Talkers. Okay. Yeah, and uh, Flags of Our Fathers. Oh, 
Okay. Yeah. So. So it blew you away a little bit. Well, yeah, it blew me away. I I, I knew his previous work at the time, and uh, yeah, when he called me up, he was just like, "Yeah, hey, I got this idea, and I've seen your book, and it's really great." And and I was like, uh, "You're you're pulling my leg." No, it's <laughs> like no, it's really me. Like, and I was like, "Oh," and after a while, I was like, "Okay, wow." And it's like, "Really?" And then, so it was really one of those things where, yeah, I was starstruck, and I was like, really taken not taken back, but I was like, uh, I was like wow, what can we do or what, you know, um, uh, what do you want to do? Um, but then it was just one of those things where like the, we had a couple of phone calls and we had, we met one, he was living in Ottawa at the time, saw him and then he was doing some other like TV work and stuff. And I was like, okay, I'll, if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. But it was really, it was a really great conversation. It was really great, uh, meeting with him and talking to him. Um, but yeah, like I said, word spread because I did a lot of the promotion online. Uh, this was before Facebook or Twitter, uh, even before MySpace. And I b- developed a little small following. And when I actually was able to release the book, um, I had people in like overseas asking for a copy in uh, South America and States. It was really, I think I managed to sell 8,000 copies on, our, on my own. So... It was a really great accomplishment. Did, uh, did anyone in the media catch that? Oh yeah, no, I had I, I was caught, ABTN did a story. I think CBC did a story at the time. Good. No, oh, excuse me. Um, and it was really like it was really one of those whirlwinds, right? But once again, too, I was just like no one else had no like I was trying to find people that were doing the same thing, and nobody was doing it yet. And I do, but I do remember um, after the book was out, uh, Jay Ojik. Uh, he contacted, he approached me and he was like, this is amazing. And he showed me what he was doing. I was like, wow, your book is awesome. Like that was the, the Raven. It was a really great book. Um, and it was just, but it was like one of those things where it's like, everything was kind of happening really fast or, or really slow. And I didn't know how to, uh, get them all to gel together or like, what do we do next? Yep. Right. Like it was, it was one of those weird, like, what do we do next to get to the next stage? And, uh, and it just got to the point where I was like, okay, like I said, I got to focus on my family and I'm going to do that and I'll I'll come back to it. Uh, because doing self-publishing is expensive. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Because you did this on your own because no one could catch what you were trying to do because you're, you're a first. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the great thing about being first is that uh, everyone learns from my mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's that. And, and you did all of this out of, out of New Brunswick? Uh, yes and no. Like, uh, like, uh, I had uh, friends from school that I went with uh, or that I graduated with. And uh, I was like, look, I can't do this by myself. Hmm. Um, here's the idea. Here's the concept. What do you guys think? And they were like, we love it. Let's, you know, when, uh, if you need any help, then let's get it going. So when I first made that proposal and versus when I finally got the money to get this off the ground, it was like a good two year period. And I was lucky that everyone was still interested in not doing anything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I said, the learning, the learning experience was, uh, at the time was trying to, uh, self publish and without any real help yeah. minus the, the funding I got from the, uh, feds. Um, Great. Part of why I ask is that one of the narratives in New Brunswick today is young people staying here and making their careers here and finding their way. And, and many of the people I get to interview are trailblazers. They're doing something that no one's done before. They're trying to figure out how to fit criteria to get funding, but they know in their heart, I need to do it this way because that's where the breakthrough will occur. And your story sounds like it was about 10 or 15 years ahead of the current curve <laughs> of that same behavior in a medium that most people don't even take as a maybe take it seriously because comic book culture is very powerful storytelling is beyond you know it's it's core to almost everything we do but we're just some people are just starting to wake up to the power of storytelling now yeah oh yeah and that and that's the thing too like um because i was trying to break through the barrier like i said the the parameters are pretty clear when i was writing the book it's like it's not a superhero book it's not going to be, uh, I'm going to get rid of any stereotypical imagery in there. I want to try and do this as uh, honestly as I possibly can. Um, those are my parameters. And I wanted something that uh, Native kids, like 
kids in my community to be proud of because like I said they were the ones that inspired me to do this and I didn't want to let them down yeah so even then they were there every time I got a drawing or a concept I was like what do you guys think what do you guys think and they're like we need to see more and I'm like okay if you guys like it then I'm doing something right <laughs> um but uh, but yeah like I said we uh all, a lot of the things that I worked out of my home in Listigich, uh and the guys that helped me out they were from their home we just you know decent internet connection that's all we needed uh, so we were doing a lot of things that were like, yeah, we didn't, we, uh, my, the, the work, my work, my work schedule didn't fit the mold. The work, uh, it wasn't a traditional office space. It was really yeah. good, internet, good internet connection. You got the software. I got the, you know, we've got the tools. Yeah. Let's do it. Straight down. And just be able to communicate and be able to communicate consistently and we'll be, we'll, yeah. we'll get this work done both from there yeah so to move your your story a little bit forward the um children arrive and isn't there a stretch you lived in ottawa for a while yeah so yeah so it was one of those things like i said we were it was uh one of the things that uh we wanted to do when i found out i was going to be a, a father was i wanted to give them a different i wanted to give my son a different experience than what i grew up with and uh i and well, my wife and I were on the same page with that way of thinking, and uh, she had just came come. She had just come back from Ottawa before we got together, and uh, fast forward, we we're just like, okay, we need we need to make a change, hmm. and uh, it was really like it was a toss of a coin. It was heads Halifax, tails Ottawa, <laughs> flip the coin. Ottawa one like it was that that's how it was we didn't really put a lot of thought into it mm-hmm. we were just like okay yeah oh that was the what but it what um inspired that move also too is like well okay i want to know more about the business side of things so i'm gonna go oh i'm gonna go to business school yep shouldn't be that hard it was <laughs> which where did you go carlton carlton, carlton yeah, went, yeah i went to carlton Ottawa. Yeah. yeah there were the what there but it was once again was like they said yes, and uh, I was like, okay, well, they said yes, and they, uh, and so we were like, okay, that, that's what we're going to do, and we, we told ourselves, okay, it's just going to be four years tops, and four years turned into ten yeah. years, yeah. Uh, when around that time, though, it was time to come back, and uh, we moved back in uh, 2014, yeah. yeah. And, and what brought you back to New Brunswick and to Fredericton in particular? Uh was it work? Was it combination? No, of it wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, it was just. Uh, it was just time to come back. Like there was just uh, we, the drive to, I, I, over the time I realized how disconnected we were getting, huh. right, and it was time to come back home. We gave them that. It felt like we accomplished that foundation that we we gave them something that we didn't have, um, and it was time to bring them back home to show them what home has to offer. Uh, so, um, but at the same time too, it was just like, well, I also want to finish what we started because I didn't get a chance to finish the university yep. while I was there. I was so close and it was just a really good, and I was freelancing. So there's a whole bunch of factors. I was freelancing at a time, but yep. around that time it was really drying up because of the climate and, uh, the work just wasn't there. And I was like, well, okay. I'm going to go to school and I'm going to give this the old college try again. Yeah. And, uh, and and it was a little bit easier this time too because the kids were older uh, yeah. and uh, we both committed ourselves. We said, we're, we said we were going to give ourselves a strict two-year deadline mm-hmm. to uh, graduate. Uh, we exceeded that. And in, our, in, in between that or after that, we're just kind of like, well, now what? Because we're like, I was, uh, I was done one semester before my wife and I was like well there's no one's really beating down my door for work so I'm going to keep going to school mm-hmm. <laughs> so I went uh, and I went for uh, my master's in adult education I had an opportunity there and I'll be done at the rate I'm going now I'll be done at the end of summer great yeah great Managing to blend all those pieces together is it's not simple. A lot of times mainstream media when covering student life will focus on tuition, sometimes talk about quality of life, sometimes talk about the difficulties in finding a job. But they don't blend like all the transitions that can happen over a five or six year period from marriage, children, moving and all of them, all of those pieces that come into play. 
if you're willing, um, because you've touched on it lately through each of the different pieces. So you see the world and experience the world through a very particular lens. And, and the First Nations native lens, I'm hoping it one day has a larger role to play in some of the directions that our country needs to go in or province needs to go in. As simple as doing circle work in a community or understanding where we come from and how we got here. And, and you've lightly t touched on what that's like for you because you're <laughs> being very respectful, which is great. But if you're willing, <clears throat> could you share or teach us... Um, Here's an example of we could have done it this way instead of doing it that way. If that makes sense, it makes sense. But I, I, think I, spot, I, I think I'm still trying to figure that out huh. because huh. there, there are th like coming back, uh, coming back. I knew what I was coming back to. Yeah, because you're being very gentle, but I suspect you're in the thick of it on on some major kind of themes or issues, whether it's a, a university setting. Yeah, and the need for changes and shifts, or your social setting as you raise children, getting them to be aware of all cultures. It, well, and that was the it was the culture shock. Okay, well, the culture shock was going into the boiling pot that was Ottawa. Hmm. So it was, uh, we all gelled together. But I did notice that it got to the point when we were in Ottawa, we weren't really talking about like, uh, if you're Indian or if you're Native. Don't say anything. Just you're part of the you're part of the you're part of the non-white kids. You're going to that group, and uh, and and when I I saw it and I was just kind of like, ah, oh, okay, we guys keep talking about uh, equality and um, integration, and I was just kind of like, but you guys are not really talking. No one's talking about our history and if they're talking about our history they're leaving a big chunk out and uh, I think what what uh, shook us was when uh, and where I had to take a stand where we both took a stand was um, when our oldest son came back from a class and uh, we were and he said uh, yeah we were learning about uh, native people today and just the way he said it and I'm just like you mean you're learning about us no 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 Native people. And I was like, okay, we messed up somewhere. And it was, uh, and we, we were just, uh, I was like, yeah, that's us. I'm like, no, that's not us. And I was like, you, it, got, it was an argument, right? Not just like, this is who we are, son. Like, what did they talk about? And um, so that was, uh, that was a really tough pill to swallow. And it was, that was kind of like, okay, we got to come back home because, they're what they're they're talking about us like we're not even here or if we are it's too it's it's only when they want to talk about it or when it's up, when it makes them feel good to talk about it not when uh ignoring the other larger issues at play uh i was surprised i didn't talk about it during like uh like i remember being on uh, parliament hill for the apology i remember being uh downtown once again uh for i'll know more you know, these were big, significant things. And I was even just like, how, how come no one's talking about this? Or, it, you know, it got a lot of coverage, but then when it was done, it was done. And I, and I kind of saw it was going to, I, I kind of saw that happening. And I was like, we're getting really great momentum here, guys. Like people are listening. And then I just, I just had this weird feeling in my stomach. I was like, okay, it's going to be like the sound clip's going to be done and they're going to get their news beat and it's going to be on to the next thing. And sure enough, that's in my mind. That's what happened. Um, I mean, but Idle Moore is still online. It's still, they're still, they still have a presence, and it's just as vital now as it was back then. Um, but I guess, yeah, it was. It was really one of those things where uh, this is what we're like. If they're not really, if this is how they're treating us in Ottawa, I'm pretty sure it's going to be just as bad, or it hasn't really changed much here. And sure enough, like I was, just, but the weird thing is, is home is home. And I knew how to, I'd rather <laughs> the devil, you know, is better than the devil. You don't. So I was just kind of like, we're going back home. Okay, great. What about our kids? We'll, we're, <laughs> we'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah, that's what that is. Um, 
Yeah. So yeah, no, it was it was really one of those things. I do, like I said, a lot of things are coming back, and a lot of the the things I experienced growing up, I was like, oh man, maybe it's changed a little bit. And I mean, we moved the dial a little bit, but there was still like I was just like, uh, the, the gaps are still the there. gaps were still there. Uh, it was more. It was the the divide was still there, but that's just something that uh, growing up. I, I, I lived it and I never really, I saw it, but I didn't know what it, what it looked like. And as I got older, I was like, oh, okay, it's still here. Like, oh, I know what it is now. Like mm-hmm. you guys over there, we'll stay over here. Don't bother us and we won't bother you. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but I was like, we, we can't live like that. In doing research for the show we did on Tap and Adney and the survival of the First Nations or native birch bark canoe. Um, there is a video clip somewhere on the internet that speaks to building the birch bark canoe and it's a collaborative project Mm -hmm. and the people speaking on behalf of the structure of it all like the leader of the project showed you know men and women first nations whites um, some other cultures mixed in and the key point he wanted to stress is we need to do it together not just sort of talk but the canoe isn't just about building a canoe it's a There's a whole connection to land, history, techniques, as well as sharing of the construction process. Yep. So I I wanted to take that clip and get a million people (laughs) to to watch it. It's like, it's right. All the clues and resources are right there in front of us. But we need a behavior change. Yeah. We need to to do it. Uh, And I'm, I'm sort of in the group that is sort of the root of the problem. (laughs) <laughs> rather than the, the group that says, but we could be doing it this way instead of that way, which is... Uh, so now you've moved back to New Brunswick, and if you're willing to wander into some of that, New Brunswick has several big issues that it needs to deal with, from mining or pipelines and such, but still the root dynamic seems to be a, a disconnect in the relationship and communication with First Nations. Does this move through your world at all? Is that a fair question to go explore for a bit? Oh. Uh, I don't know how to really explore it. It's how would you like to see it resolved, or what would you see as a better process? It's it's listening, uh, like really listening to uh, what the community wants, um, and it, this goes beyond. Uh, think about it this way: if somebody in the neighborhood wanted to do something. Um, but instead of talking to the community, talking to the neighborhood, they just talked to the MLA. The MLA said, yep, do it. Didn't talk to anybody else here and goes ahead and does whatever project they want to do. Some people find out about it in the neighborhood and you're just like, we didn't hear about this. We don't know. Like, what are you talking about? How come you didn't talk to me about this? You're going to be upset, right? Or you might be upset. Like, how come you didn't say anything or how, like... Oh, we already got approval. It's all good. Don't worry about it. You're going to like it. Uh, so, like, I try, like, look at it through that lens, right? Like, just because you went to, an, like, what is consent? What is uh, consulting? What is informing, right? Like, if you're just going, and I've seen things where it's just like, I've seen meetings, um, uh, not here, uh, but I remember being part of me and looking around. I was like, "Oh yeah, we got consent. They're over there in the corner. We told them." I'm like that's not. You just told two people that, and they're supposed to represent. You're using that as a representation for everybody. Yeah. Like yeah. that's not right. Yeah. Uh, and the same thing goes for any of those issues, right? Like just because uh, you might have gotten uh, consent from an elected official doesn't mean that you got it from the people that are going to be impacted by the decisions that. You're going to be that you uh, the decision that you're you're moving forward with. So, in some ways, you're speaking to the structure of the right to consult. I think it's now negotiated in the several contracts. When I read in the news about mining companies, pipeline companies, they've got several steps that they have to meet, and one of them is uh, you have to consult with First Nations. Yes, on that. So it sounds similar to that, but at the same time, fascinating to expand that same dynamic but apply it maybe to another culture is 2009 when a small group of 
um, elected officials and non-elected officials went to Quebec City to try to sell NB Power to Quebec Hydro, it had the same dynamics. A small group was deciding on behalf of an awful lot of other people without truly consulting or conversation yeah. about it. And so the kickback was quite phenomenal when a population woke up a little bit and said, no, no, you can't make that decision without talking to us. Right. But you guys are allowed to get upset about it <laughs> and be like, oh, okay, we're going to fix this process. But when we get upset about something like, oh, oh, they're angry again. We got to either like it, it. And that's those perceptions. Like, it's just awful. Like, yeah. White guy wants to sell and be part of Quebec. Oh, oh, we got to do something. Native person's upset about pipeline. Oh, oh, like there we go. Angry Indian. Like, like it, it like it's I'm, just it's one of those like I'm laughing, but it's also very sad. It, no, it's sad. Yeah, because there is no us. No, it's and and but it, and it goes back to Listen, knowing knowing our history. Well, why are we upset? Then? Like, well, why are you guys so upset? Well, what do you think? Like, there, there's a different like the the life and the things that I grew up with are different than the life like the life that you grew up with and the things that I had to deal with and the things that I know. Um. Like even like living within the constructs of the Indian Act, um, you know, I have to deal with like, oh, you get tax free gas, or you get free education. Like, do you realize what I live under though? Like, I don't. It's it's not a tax free holiday. Uh, I don't like anything. I uh, the if I build a house on reserve, it's worthless. I can put whatever there's. There, I can build a. Two hundred fifty thousand, half a million dollar home, worthless, crown land. Um, and why? Like, and why is it crown land? Because we were, it's, it, it's all based off the Indian Act, and the, that destructive policy really control, like, con, like we're the only ones that have a policy that controls our identity. I have to be aware of. Uh, not that I have to be aware, but like you, I have, I have a number, and like the thing that I don't realize is that we live in segregation. This is just like an apartheid. It is an apartheid system. Hmm. Like you guys stay here. We have registration of all you guys. We keep track of everything that you guys do. Oh, and also we know when you're going to be. We know when you're not going to be native anymore. We have we have a system to figure out how much Indian you're allowed to be. And, and recently there was a story in the news the past two months there was some sort of a decision that was made that then affected the, the number of people that would qualify as First Nation status. Yeah. And, and it was going to double the number. It, yeah. It, but, but it was just like what you described. It was like this percentage, that percentage. So, but it controls, like, so unlike you, uh, you, you can say like, oh, I'm Irish Canadian, I've got this rich heritage and really proud of who I am and where I'm from. I can do whatever I want. I can, my grandchildren will, will still be Irish Canadian. If my great grandchildren marry out, then they're just Canadian and the government size. How do you reconcile that concept of identity? So the government has a policy on identity Yes. and culture. Yes. They figured it out that, and it's just a waiting, in my mind, it's a waiting game. We are going to wait them out. We tried breeding them out. It's not happening. We're just going to wait them out. Yeah. One of the largest growing populations in Canada is First Nations. Yeah. But if you look deeper too, like the, 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 and that, and that's the thing too, it's like, oh, waiting out's not working. Let's, <laughs> let's try and, we're going to, we're going to work this policy again yeah. to make sure that there's yeah. eventually going to, we don't have to worry about Indians anymore. And, uh, that's the, and so it's, it's really one of those, and that's the thing that I struggle with. I'm like, well, so, and I, but I, it circles back to the, the native artist. Who am I? Am I an artist? It, it, it I, the whole identity thing is a really, it's something that I struggle with because yes, I'm Mi'kmaq. Well, how long am I going to be Mi'kmaq? You don't have to worry about how long you're going to be. Scottish, Irish, Scottish, Scottish, whatever. Irish, whatever. You, know. you don't have to worry about how long you're going to be that way. Yep. I have to be conscious about lineage, uh, identity, blood quantum. Like they've got it down to a, uh, not a science, but they're just like, okay, 
in three generations, he could be, we can not worry about them anymore. They're going to be Canadian now. Hmm. We don't have to worry about land. We don't have to worry about their health or whatever. Yep. No more Indians. <laughs> yep. I'm just hanging in here because it's powerful. It's, yeah. it's just when thought about in this context and you want to talk about how to build a province or how to build a country, how can you not make that better? Or how, how can you not go back to, to that relationship and that core thing? So maybe towards the direction of a positive or to help the audience with, okay, how do we get at this? And you're a storyteller. And your storytelling attaches to culture. Do you see storytelling as being one of those healing arts as well as creative arts? It's a real for me. It's a healing art. It it has to be like I find therapy in the writing that I like the projects that I've, I've attached myself to. I do find like after the pro, after I'm done writing, I'm like, okay, I got it out. I'm good. I'm good. Mind you, something else pops up, and I'm like, I need to write again. <laughs> But uh, at least I'm able to incorporate. Uh, every time I write, I always try to put something new in there, or some type of like something that will just at least spark the interest of the reader. And I want to empower and inspire uh, not just native kids to say that, look, I, it can be done. Look, we're doing it. Um, but non-native kids, when they pick up the book, I try to write for everybody. And I want them to ask questions. I want them to, like, well, why is why is he writing it like this, or why is it? How come how come these native characters are the main characters? How come the what? I mean, sacred circles. How comes the how come the white character is the background character? Well, there's a reason why he's a psychic. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it's one of those things that I, I try to play with. I was trying to play with uh, uh, play with the genre and play with the the tropes. And when you think when you're talking about reconciliation, what it what it is, it's realizing. On both sides, it's realizing your story, realizing your history, and figuring that part out. Like we have a really complex history, and 150 years is not a long time. Yes, yes, right? especially compared to First Nations history in right. Turtle Island. Right, and that, and like so, and whose story do you count with? Like, no, we don't we don't count anything from 1491, 1492 on. Yeah. Oh, okay. Now you guys didn't record anything. Like, uh, we have our stories. Yes. Listen to the elders. Listen to what they have to say. Like they're, they're in there. Nope, it's not. It's not our way of doing things. Well, that's the issue. You're not listening to our ways. We have, we keep on bending the rules to try and play your game. But every time we get close enough, you guys change the rules. Like nope, it's got to be this way now. Oh, you didn't source it right. Oh, it wasn't recorded properly. Oh, you didn't write it. Then. Like, you know what? I don't. <laughs> there's been, there's been times where just like you know what? I, I'm I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> just what? leave leave me alone and I'll just keep on doing things my way. Yeah. So and that's and, and then that's the thing that I wrestle with is just like if you don't fit the mold that they're trying to put you in, um, how are you supposed to grow as an artist or a professional or you, I see things in my experiences mold me and shape me and help my decision making. Yep. But if it doesn't line up, I gotta change my I got I have to change my thinking to fit their mold and it's one of those things where I'm just kind of like I've been going against the grain for so long and I've managed to make a decent living out of it I think I'm going to keep on doing yeah <laughs> doing things and, my way <laughs> and, and that way you can you can follow in the spirit at least of those like you where they never fit any mold but they created breakthroughs because they hung in there long enough and finally the light bulb went on in a larger audience from Einstein who had problems with math but you know but he hung in there yeah. with it right because something was itching and driving and and that'll help maybe a larger culture or a larger society start to understand there are other ways of organizing ourselves that have maybe a better relationship with land and air and water that can actually be better for an economy and be better for a political body and be better for a community yeah I, there's there's so many like I mean it's not like my, there's gonna have, it needs to be like a major shift. I'm not saying like oil and gas is going anywhere anytime soon, but there are breakthroughs, there are innovations, and it's like, well, what's the fear then? Like, what's why are you guys so scared to try something different? Like I said, the the things that I've like, and, and that's and I think that's the struggle that I face with. I'm just like, 
yes, it's scary, but until if like until you try it, then you know take it as far as you can get, yeah. right? And then worry about the con. Like for me, take it as far as you get. Worry about the consequences later, because you're never gonna gain. You're like you're gonna if you're constantly sitting there like, oh, I'm not gonna do it. Cause I'm too scared. Well, then you're never gonna do anything. Yeah. And that's what I've that's what I noticed when I'm coming back. Like I got these great ideas. Yeah, but we don't. It's too scary. <laughs> All right, then. Fear of risk. All right. What if I try it like this? No, it's still too different. <laughs> okay. How about if I... You know what? I'm just going to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And find your own way. Yeah. And, and I'll just find it. Yeah. I'll just... Someone's going to say yes. Someone's going to always, like, you're, you just got to, you know, be... A... For me, it's, like I said, being a good listener and, and then finding those opportunities and uh, that for... Find those opportunities uh, with people that will listen, and then once you got their ear, here's what here's my idea, here's my plan, here's what I want to do, and then the other part's just luck. <laughs> yeah, you need yeah you need a little bit of fate to come along and give you something. Yeah. Um, we have about a couple of minutes left. How would you like to wrap us up? Oh, geez. Uh, Is there something you want to do about um, storytelling? Something about uh, the work you've done? Something you'd like to see happen in the future? Uh, future? Well, no. I mean, my future, like I said, my big thing is just inspiring youth. Uh, I was, uh, when we moved back here, I had an opportunity to speak to the kids at Devon Middle School. And it reminded me of why I really liked uh, teaching. Um, and it was seeing that light go off. And I was in a room. It was great because I was in a room with uh, Native and non-Native kids and they just wanted to uh they were just amazed to see someone doing comic books or writing stories and the questions i was getting the questions i was getting were just like uh well, what 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 got you started and and just sharing sharing that and um i'm not i didn't go into those i didn't go into that classroom saying okay you 40 kids you're all going to be artists now no you 40 kids Follow your dream. Follow like if you got something that you want to do, do it. Because I did it, and I'm here talk, telling you guys that if you fo- if you follow it, good things are gonna happen. And that's 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 the uh, that's the thing I try to do. That's what I aim for. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon. Patreon.